Good morning. Today is Wednesday, the 24th day of Shvat, and today we are learning the entire chapter 24 in Tanya. And uh, this chapter, the Alter Rebbe, takes us another step in reaching the understanding of how easy it is to do the right thing. Knowing this truth, what we are going to learn in this chapter will make it much easier for us, for each and every one of us, to do the right thing, to follow the ways of Hashem. And this is what Al Tareb explained. It is very easy, very near to you to, in, in your heart, in your mind, to do it, to do the right thing. It's very easy. And Al Tareb explained in the previous chapters one way of getting understanding, feeling of love and fear of Hashem is a difficult way. That is the way of contemplating in the greatness of Hashem. Because that's not everybody can do it. But those who can do it can develop a feeling of love and fear to Hashem because they appreciate the greatness of Hashem. The more they appreciate, the more they develop a feeling of love and fear of Hashem. But what about people who cannot, not in that level, for whatever reason, not in the level to be able to develop this feeling of fear and love to Hashem that should affect their actions, speech, and thoughts? Says the Alter Rebbe, for them is also near. How? Because there is, you don't have to create a new love. It's in there. It's in you. You have the love of Hashem. It's a natural love in every single Jew. Ahava Mesoteras, the hidden love that we have inherited from our ancestors. Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov. And therefore, all you have to do is realize that you love Hashem, you, want to, you don't want to be separated. And we know this for a fact, because every Jew, for the most part, would give his life up. If, if when push comes to shove, and a person is tested whether to be connected or disconnected from Hashem, to worship idols or something like that, he will give up his life, he or she. And yet, this is also true not only to idolatry. Idolatry, people know that if, God forbid, doing idolatry can, disconnects me from Hashem. What about the rest of the mitzvahs? What about the regular commandments in the Torah? Any mitzvah? They're not speaking Lashon Hara, eating kosher, keeping Shabbos, or all, all other mitzvahs, all other commandments. Says the Alter Rebbe, even those things, when we realize the oneness of Hashem. Hashem is everything. And by a person doing anything which is against the will of Hashem, separates him from Hashem. Knowing this truth, if you think about it, that then you will not do it. You don't need to have the greatest mind of understanding the greatness of Hashem. All you have to keep in mind is to remember that you're a Jew. You remember that you have this hidden love to Hashem. The love is there. And remember that every mitzvah connects you to Hashem. And God forbid, every Aveira separates you from Hashem. So that will make the person stop. So in the last chapter, the Alter Rebbe explained how every mitzvah connects a person to Hashem. And especially the study of the Torah. When you study the Torah. The, the, that is the perfect connection to Hashem because this is the deepest, the Torah is the deepest will, the will of God, which is the, connected with the essence of Hashem. So studying the Torah connects to Hashem deeply. And in this chapter, chapter 24, Alter Rebbe is going to explain how the other side, that when a person violates one of the transgressions, that severs that connection with God. And in a way, the person, the Jew who does that, goes down a level even lower than the evil shells themselves. And we explain why. Because whatever Hashem created in this world, even the, the bad things, the evil things, 
the clip is what it's called, the, the, the impurity. It's here for a purpose. And the purpose is to, to fulfill their mission in this world. Their mission, whatever the mission is, to test us, to give us ability to overpower them. But they're fulfilling their mission. A Jew, on the other hand, that takes his free choice and he chooses to go to do something against the will of Hashem is even lower than them. So again, those are the things that will keep us, when we keep this in mind, when we understand this truth, we will be able to overcome our temptations and not to sin. So let's see inside how the Alter Rebbe explains it in this long chapter, 24, bear with us. Says the Alter Rebbe, since everything in the realm of holiness has its counterpart in the unholy realms of the Sitra Acha, the other side, there is also an unholy counterpart to the observance of the mitzvahs and Torah study, which produce union with God. What is the counterpart? These are the 365 prohibitions stated in the Torah and all the rabbinical prohibitions, the rabbinical prohibitions as well. Since they are contrary to the very opposite and the very opposite of God, of God's will and wisdom. Therefore, they, they represent total and complete separation from his unity and oneness. They, all of the prohibitions, they represent the total separation from Hashem. They are the same as the Sitra Acha and the Klippa, which are called idolatry and other gods. Since the internal aspect of the divine will is concealed from them, we mentioned this earlier in the in Tanya, the previous chapters, that the other gods are called other gods. Why? Because the word other comes also from the word acherim in Hebrew, is others, which from the same word as achoraim, meaning from the back part, the hind, the hind part. They, cut, they receive everything from the back. So, and just as the forbidden actions themselves represent separation from Hashem, so too, the three garments of a Jew's animal soul, which stems from the clipper of Noiga, as we mentioned earlier, the three garments of the animal soul of a Jew comes from Klippas Noiga. It's a, it's a shell which is neutral. It can be, become holy and can be lowered to the lowest places. So the garments of the soul Namely, the thoughts, speech, and action. The thoughts, speech, and actions that are closed in, meaning you think, you speak, and act in violation of the 365 Torah prohibitions or any of the rabbinic injunctions. So they too, the garments that you that do them also are separated from Hashem. Not only that, and also similarly, the, the essence of the soul itself, which is closed in the garments. The garments serve the soul. So the soul that is 
that is clothed in the garments are also, the soul is also connected with the evil at the time when it, for, when it does the sin. Kulam meyuchodim mamesh besitra achre veklipazu anikreis avaydazara. All of them become completely united with this sitra achre and klipa that is called avaydazara, it's called idolatry. So when a person goes against the will of Hashem, is at that moment everything the person is connected, is, is thought, speech, and action, and his soul also is connected and invested now and united with the clipper, with the Avodazara, with the other side. Says the Alter Rebbe, but you know what? It's not only that it's united with them, it's even worse, it's in a lower level than them, they themselves. Not only are they united with the clip and, and thus equal to it, but, but furthermore, they become secondary and subordinate to it and much lower and more debased than them and a much lower level than the evil themselves. Why? So the al explains like this. Al-Tareb explains that the evil side, the, the, the evil powers, they have their mission. God created them for a mission. And whatever happens, whatever they do in this world, they do, they fulfill God's mission. Of course, it's a very unpleasant mission. There's a famous example that Al-Tareb brings in, a, in another uh, chapter about uh, the, uh, the king that wants, wants to test his son to see how strong his morals are. So he hires a harlot to go and try to seduce the, king, the king's son. So she fulfills her mission and she does her best. What does she want? What does she want the son to listen to or not? Obviously not. But yet she does everything possible to try to seduce him. So the same thing is in every, all the evil things in this world, they have a mission in this world. And they fulfill God's mission. The example that the Rebbe is bringing here is also with the story of Bilam. What happened with Bilam? Remember the story? When he's hired by Balak to go and curse the Jews, what does he say? He says to Balak, I cannot do anything. Whatever, only what Hashem lets me say, that, that I can say. Who is that this question? What does it mean? Bilam, why? He couldn't, he couldn't just say something against? He hated the Jews. He was the biggest anti-Semite. And he was an evil person, a wicked person. So what does it mean that he says, that I couldn't do anything. He has free choice. He can do, he can curse if he wants. But obviously what that means is that the evil power within him is something that to be able to curse, that power is given to him only the way Hashem wants. And he cannot go against the will of Hashem. So yes, he as a person is bad, but the powers that he has, the evil powers that he has is something which is given in this world for whatever reason, Hashem decided to put it in this world. But when a Jew goes, and on, on a, being that a Jew is invested, has the godly soul, and it's in the physical body, in this physical world, and when he goes against the will of Hashem, he is lower than the evil forces themselves. That's what the Alter Rebbe says here. Continues the Alter Rebbe. Much lower than that. Because the clippus is not clothed in a corporal body and hence is more exposed to the divine light. Shalom. 
He says, it knows, the clippers, the evil sign knows its maker and does not rebel against them, God forbid, by any independent act of sending its evil messengers other than in the service of Hashem. And as Bilam said, I cannot violate the word of God. So, so the other side, they do not, they don't deny God. They, they follow the, the, the way Hashem wants. They just fulfill their mission. Although the clippers are called Avodah Zara, Avodah Zara means idolatry, which is a denial of God, but yet they refer to him, to God, as the God of gods, indicating that they do not deny him completely. They cannot violate God's will because they know and perceive that he is their life and sustenance since they derive their nurture from the hindermost aspects of the divine will which encompasses them. So they receive their life, as we mentioned in the previous chapter from the back, that, that, that just like a person gives something to someone who doesn't, he doesn't want to give him, but he has no choice. He gives him. He has to give him. So he gives him like from the back, not from the face. But they know that they receive their life force from Hashem. It is only the sustenance and life force that is within them, meaning the internal life force which constitutes the identity of every creature, created being. As we explained earlier in chapter 22, that is in a state of exile. So that they regard themselves as gods, which is a denial of God's unity. So they do have this sense of self that they exist and they've consider themselves, but they do not deny God completely. But they are not so completely heretical, heretical as to deny God and to assert that, he's, that he does not exist. On the contrary, they regard him as the God of gods. So they consider themselves sort of a, of a God, but God is the God of all gods. Recognizing that their life and existence ultimately derive from his will. And therefore, they never rebel against God's will. Whatever they do, they do in God's mission. Therefore, what it, what it follows, it follows then that a person who does violate God's will is greatly inferior, is inferior to and more debased than the Sitra Achra and the Klippa, which are called Aveda Zara and other gods. He is separate completely from God's unity and, and, and oneness, even more than they are. As though denying his unity even more radically than they, God forbid. You see it always whenever a Jew falls in the other side because throughout history there was, there was Jews that went and against they became the the, the Moisrim, those who the, who or followed the Goyim and joined them they became such so much more against the Jews more than the Goyim themselves the power that a Jew has to go down he drags with him the power that he has into the other side 
And that's what happens if, when a person, God forbid, violates Hashem's will. He becomes even lower than the Klippus. This is similar to what it's, it is written in Eitz Chaim, Portal 42, end of chapter 4. It says over there that the evil in this corporal world is the dregs of the coarse clippus. It is the sediment of the, pur- the purifying process and so on. What does that mean? Time explains over there that in the, in the world, we have the different levels of the world. You have the higher world, Atzilus, Peria, Yetzirah, Asiya. Just like when you have the dregs, when you have uh, the wine, you make wine, you have the dregs. So whatever is squeezed in the leftovers, dregs. Or another example can, that is used, if you have... Um, if you have a refinery that makes uh, that uh, brings uh, you you take silver you find silver that is that is hidden in the dirt so it goes through one time one process and then you have pure silver coming out and then you have the leftovers but then you take it to a next process another refinery you took you refine it once once again not sure the, the, the terms exactly what is used over there, what kind of machinery, but they take basically even the, the leftovers, of it, which are the waste, you can still find more silver in them. It goes through another process. And again and again, how many times? Finally, you have the leftovers, which is the dirt, the waste of that it has no silver at all. So similarly, when you have the, in the different levels of Godlin, of, of the worlds, in the higher level, the, uh, the higher world, the world of Atzilus is, is pure godliness. Godliness is sensed. The lower you go, the less you feel the godliness is sensed. And it remains the waste, it remains things that are coarse and not felt, the godliness is not felt. So when you get to this world, this is the lowest of the lowest where the godliness is the least felt. And you have the waste, so to speak. And that's why the Rebbe says, in this world, being that the godliness is so concealed, it went through all the processes through the worlds, and, 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 and whatever is left here is something which is totally concealed. Only the, you see only the waste, only the dirt. That is why the actions of this world is evil. There's a lot of evil in this world. And our job is to fight. And to reveal the godliness. Says the Alter Rebbe, Velochein, Kol Maise Oilamaze Koshim Veroim, Veroshem Govirma Vichulu. For this reason, all matters of this world are harsh and evil, and the wicked prevail in it, and so forth. Now, this, the Alter Rebbe goes to explain. So now we understand that every time a person does something wrong, against the will of Hashem. He separates himself completely from Hashem. And even worse than the evil themselves, as we just explained. That's what the Alt Rebbe says, the, the Gemara says, regarding the, that says in the Torah, regarding a woman that is unfaithful to her husband. And says the Gemara, says the Torah, kisiste ishtay, that a person that is wife, will move away from the, from the right track. The word siste is written with a sin, which can read as siste, meaning acting foolish. And this is a very basic understanding of what causes a person to, fulfill, to commit a sin. This is a foolish, the folly that enters the person's mind to think that it's okay, it's no big deal. I'm going against, but uh, it's no big deal. That doesn't separate me from God. A person only violates, only commits a sin, only when the foolishness enters his, his, his mind. It's like a temporary insanity. He doesn't realize what, what he's doing. Continues the Alter Rebbe. This is why our sages say it. 
Al Paso Kisiste Ishtoi. Explanation. The commenter, the commenter of our sages, and the verse, if a man's wife turns aside and commits adultery, says the says the our commentaries explain that this is referring to every single Jew. Every single Jew with Hashem is like we are in a marriage. And if we violate the marriage, if we go in, and against a commit adultery, the going against Hashem, it is because a fully a foolishness enters our, our mind. No man, no man commits any transgressions unless a spirit of folly is entered into him, into him. And that Rebbe explains that now, the Rebbe says now, he says like this, you know, if this, taking this, even a, a, a woman who, who went to law, so low that she, she goes and commits adultery, and she does it, why? Because she thinks it's okay, it's no big deal. That same woman, who is so careless about moral things, if you take this woman and you tell her to worship idols, she would say no. If you tell her, if you don't do it, I'll kill you, she'll say, she'll say I don't care. If you tell her, don't worship the idol, just bow down, just make sure, make it look like as if you're worshiping the idol. If you don't mean it, she'll say, no, I'm not going to do it. Why? Because here she feels that this will separate her from Hashem. But doing the other things, she doesn't feel that, and that is the foolishness. She doesn't realize that this also separates her from Hashem. And that is the same thing to every person. Says the as even the adulterous woman with her frivolous nature. She could have controlled her passionate drive were it not for the spirit of folly within her. What is the spirit of folly? Which covers and conceals the hidden love within, within her divine soul. She has her divine soul that yearns to cleave to her to her faith in God and to his unity and oneness and that resists even the pain of death. Even if she's would suffer pain of death, any separation from his unity through idol, idol worship, she would, she, would, she would suffer that. Not only she would do it not to worship idols, even if just for bowing down. Even if this idol worship would consist merely of an empty act of prostrating herself before the idolized object without any belief in her heart. Even if she doesn't have any belief in the validity of the idol worship, she would still give her life up. If her hidden love of God has the power to enable her to face death rather than be separated from Hashem, surely then it is within her power to overcome the temptation and lust for adultery, which is lighter suffering than death. May God protect us. So that's not such a big sacrifice, and yet she doesn't. She doesn't. She doesn't uh, succeed. She doesn't uh, keep it. She she falls. She does it. Why? Because she thinks that that's not such a big deal. She doesn't realize the effect of her act. Now the distinction she makes between the prohibition against adultery and that against idolatry is also but a spirit of folly that is stemming from the klipa. 
Amalbeshes le nefesh alikis ad prines chokma shabba. Now, this spirit of Ali envelops the divine soul only up to, but not including, its faculty of chokma. Velo yad bichlal. Mipnei oir Hashem amelubish bachokma kanis kalayel. Because of the light, divine light that is clothed in the faculty of Chachma, as explained above, what is he saying? That the folly, the foolishness, can only reach only to the up until the level of Chachma, the very essence. When a, when a person reaches the level of Chachma, which is the godly soul in the person, when that is revealed, there. The spirit of Ali cannot control them. But up until there, the foolishness works and it causes the person to do foolish things. But what is the truth? The truth is, I feel in truth, however, even he who commits a minor sin transgresses the divine will. And he is completely sundered from God's unity and oneness. He's completely separated from Hashem at the moment. Even more than the Sitra Ach and the Klippe, which are called strange gods and idolatry. And more than all the things of this world that are derived from them, what are the things in the world that are derived from the other side, from the evil side? Namely the unclean cattle, beasts and birds and vermin and reptiles which all received the life force from the three complete, completely unclean Kalipas, as we mentioned earlier in the chap in the Tanya. As our sages have said, when a man sins, he is told that the net preceded it, preceded you. A kind of mosquito or the net is that preceded you. What does it mean? The preceded you means it, it's in a higher level. Pirush. Why, why is he choosing a net, that, that mosquito? That means that even that net, which has, as the Talmud states, consumes food but does not uh, excrete. Meaning, this creature, whatever it is, the mosquito, or it, it is a, a, a creature that takes in, but doesn't exert, doesn't bring, take out anything, doesn't bring any waste. This is a definition of the Klippa. This is a definition of the other side. Kedusha, holiness, gives. So any animal if, that gives waste, the waste also is used for, for good things. Fertilizes, whatever it does. But this Yitush is the epitome of the clip of the other side, which is total evil, that it only takes, it doesn't give. Yet, a person is told that the, when the God created the world, he created that yitush, that net, that mosquito, before he created man. So obviously there's two sides to this coin. As you know, one way, of, we look at it in a positive way, in a good way, that the person says, it's like just like a king, when you build a palace, you make sure everything is there, then you bring in the king when everything is ready. So Avashem created the whole entire world, and then he brought man, introduced him to the whole, full, perfect, complete world. Complete world. And that's one side of the coin. But the other side of the coin is that we're to- a person is told that as long as you're doing God's, God's will, yes, you're like the king. But as soon as you go against God's will, then realize that you're created last. You're created last means that you're on the lowest level. In a sense, something that comes first is in a higher level. Even that net, that, that creature, that is the, is the epitome of the evil, of the impurity that doesn't even give anything, 
only takes that also was created before you. So why? Because again, when a, when this creature was created, it's, it is because God created him that way. But when a Jew goes, that is created from Hashem and is brought down and given a, a, a godly soul, and it goes against the will of Hashem, is lower than that creature itself. Continues the Alter Rebbe. So the even the, this creature that does not exert. Which is very the very lowest form of klipa and is far removed from holiness, which characteristically gives of itself even to those far from it. Nevertheless, this takes precedence over the sinner. In the order of descent of the divine life force from the divine will. So the person is even lower than the Yitush, than the Net, certainly than all the other impure things. The coach can share Balechaim at main, Vafilochai is Royce, Shekulam Ainam Shanim Tafkidam. And surely the, the other unclean creatures and even the ferocious beasts are higher than the sinner. All of these do not deviate from their divinely intended purpose. But they obey God's, God's command. Although they cannot perceive it, or animal cannot perceive God's command, yet their spirits perceives it. The animal no, and doesn't perceive God, but in the spirit they perceive God, and they see, they sense what their mission is. And Al Rebbe brings an example to show that the uh, that they the animals, the, even the impure animals, they perceive their mission. That is, it is written. The fear and dread of you shall lie upon every beast of the earth. This is what God said to Adam. As our sages explained, a wild beast never will never defy a human being unless he appears to it like an animal. A wild beast does not hurt a human being. The only reason why the wild beast hurts a human being is because the human being seems to the, be to the beast as an animal. It doesn't see a difference. Why? Because the image of God is removed once a person commits a sin. This is in fact, when confronting Tzadikim, from whose face the divine image never departs, the evil beasts are humbled before them. As is stated in the Zoya concerning the Neil in the lion's den. You know the story, the kneel in the lion's den is uh, the lions didn't touch them. And uh, there's the story also from the Orachaim, which is much uh, more recent, about uh, 300 years ago. He was once traveling with, uh, with uh, what do you call it, uh, a group of traveling, uh, taking uh, together. Um, a caravan, and the leader of the caravan, he, the Arachim, has told them that I'll travel with you, I'll pay you, but uh, on Shabbos I need to rest, I cannot travel on Shabbos. And he said, okay. So then they traveled, they went on their journey, and then the, when Shabbos came, the guy says, you know what, no, no, I don't think we're, we're going to stop. 
We're not going to make everybody, the whole caravan, wait for you, one Jew that needs to rest on Shabbos 24 hours to stay in one place. We're not doing it. So Dorchaim told him, fine, you go, I'm staying. So what? You're staying here in this wild desert with beasts, with all kind of wild animals, dangers. He says, I'm doing, I, on Shabbos, I'm not traveling. So the Orachayim HaKadosh Rabbi Chaim Ben Atar, he stayed there on Shabbos, and then a lion came over. And the lion came over straight to him. The Orachayim was a holy man. It says the Orachayim also, show, it says they showed the, the lion his holy bris. And the lion sat down next to the Orachayim, right? The whole Shabbos staying there, protecting the Orachayim. And after Shabbos, the lion kneeled for the Orachim to sit on him, and he raced all the way until he reached this, the caravan. And that's how they realized that this is a holy man. So, point is that, a lot, that an animal, when he sees a human being that has the image of God, the animal would not touch the human being because the image of God is there. The only reason why an animal touches a human being is because the image of God is gone. As soon as a person violates something, goes against the Shem. Continues the Alter He says, it is thus clear that he who sins and transgresses against God's will, even in a minor offense, is at a time he commits it completely removed from the divine holiness, meaning God's unity and oneness. And this is even more so than all the unclean creatures, the vermin and the reptiles, which derive their sustenance from the Sitra Achra and the Klippe of Avedazala. Continues that time. That here, true, we find the principle that saving a life overrides other prohibitions. And similarly, the law calls for one to commit a transgression rather than be killed. The question is, why, if we say that the, the, as committing a sin separates you from Hashem, how come, when it comes to all other Vegas, there's only three sins that the Torah says that a person should die and not commit the sins, which is uh, idolatry, adultery, and murder. But all other Vegas, the Torah says, commit the sin. Why? So that Rebbe explains, This fact that saving a life overrides other prohibition is because, as the sages explain, the Torah declares, desecrate one Shabbos for him, for his sake, so that he may live to observe other Shabbatot. The Torah says that life comes, takes precedence, because in order to be able to keep more Shabbos, it is not because of the relative leniency of the Shabbos or gravity of other sins, such as idolatry, that one is waived while other is not. That's just the Teira says, that these are various certain sins the Teira says, you should not do it even if you did life is uh, taken away. And other sins, the Torah says, no, you should do it. You should violate in order to keep. And in al Rebbe brings proof that the fact, in other words, the, the, the point that al Rebbe is trying to make is we find, we just said that every sin is like idolatry, right? And therefore, when a person realizes that any sin separates him from Hashem, he's not going to do it. So the Alter Rebbe is asking, how could you say every sin is like idolatry? We know I, every sin you're not supposed to, you're not, 
you're not supposed to give your life up. Idolatry is supposed to give your life up for it. So the Alter Rebbe says that's not because it's less severe. It is because that's the way Hashem said. How do we know that it is not less severe? So the Alter Rebbe now brings proof from the laws of Shechita. The law of Shechita, it says that a um, Sheichet, to be, to, uh, if a Sheichet means one who slaughters, makes kosher's, uh, kosher meat, slaughters animal in a kosher way. If someone who is, uh, who is a mummer, meaning is doing constantly, violating the Shabbos, his he cannot be a shaykhet. You cannot eat from, if he slaughtered an animal, you cannot eat from his shechita. But if a person, let's say, he doesn't violate Shabbos, but he violates, he's a mummer, he's what he has other problem, that he commits adultery. He commits adultery. Obviously, we're not going to choose that person for a shaykhet. But if that person did do shechita, it doesn't mean that he's that his shechita is not good. He's still considered a good shechita, even if he commits adultery. So here, what do we see here? Adultery is one of those mitzvahs that the Torah says you have to die for. Shabbos is not a mitzvah. On the contrary, you violate the Shabbos to save lives. Yet, if you do the Shabbos, if that person, the sheikhet, violates the Shabbos, then his shechita is not good. But if he violates adultery, his shechita is good. So obviously we see that Shabbos is not less severe than adultery, even though adultery you have to die for. So similarly, al Rebbe is saying the same thing. The fact that you don't, you don't have to die for Shabbos doesn't mean that it's less than idolatry. But just like by idolatry, you give your life up, the same thing is also for Shabbos. So in, in other words, that do you realize that this is severe? It is not because of the relative leniency of Shabbos or gravity of the sins such as idolatry, that one is waived while the other is not. This contention is supported by the following fact that violation of the Shabbos is a grave offense and, com and comparable to idolatry with regards to the laws of Shechita. By anyone who habitually violates a particular uh, precept, as codified in your day in the Shulchan Aruch, section two. A habitual sexual offender, on the other hand, does not have the same law applied to him as habitual idolater. Yet, the consideration of life overrides Shabbos, but not the sexual prohibition. Adultery. And Lord Xavier Zakasova. Rather, it is a scriptural decree. Now, what happens after the committing the sin? If a person, God forbid, commits a sin, then there is a difference what type of sin. A person can do Teshuvah right away, but the effect of the sin is different by different sins. An example that is that, that can be used. If let's say a person, we know, uh, and if a person is, let's say he stole a lot of goods from different people, he has a house full of stolen goods. And one day he, he, he regrets, he wants to do teshuva, he says, I, I regret, I says to Hashem, I'm, I, I repent, I want to become good. Immediately he's already considered good. Does he have to pay back and give back the goods? Of course. But even before he gives, gives back, he's already changed. He is already good. But, the, but it still has a whole work ahead of him to clean whatever he messed up. The 
after the sinful act. However, if the sin is of the type that carries neither the penalty of karet, spiritual extinction of the soul, or death at the hands of heaven, in which case the divine soul does not completely perish and is not entirely cut off from its source in the divine, in the divine, in the living God. Except that through this sin, its attachment to its source and its connection with it has been weakened somewhat. Now, the Rebbe says, based on the different levels of sins, that's what the punishment, the punishment is a process of cleansing. Corresponding to the extent and specific nature of the blemish caused by the sin in the soul and in its source in the supernal worlds. Corresponding to this, the various purifying processes and punishment in the in purgatory or in this world, meaning the suffering of the soul in purgatory, or one suffering in this world, whose purpose is to purify the soul. The whole oven each transgression and sin has its appropriate punishment. For the purpose of cleansing and removing the, the stain and the blemish caused by the specific sin. Similarly, the blemish caused by the sins carrying the penalty of death at the hands of heaven or karet varies from one sin to another. However, says Alter Rebbe, so after the sin, the sinner's animal soul which animates the body and its clo- and clothing it as well as the body itself. It returns and rises from the sitra acha and the klipa. And they draw closer to the holiness of the divine soul that pervades them. Says The divine soul always believes in the one God. And remains, the godly soul remains faithful to him even while the sin is being committed. Even while a Jew commits a sin, at that moment, he's still connected to Hashem. It is only doing it outside. We mentioned this in last night's uh, class. You can go back, a very interesting class about Moide Bemictus, admitting partially. Admitting partially, yes, I committed a sin, but I wasn't there completely. But when I sinned, I wasn't there. Not with my full heart. But at that time, the divine soul was in a state of veritable exile in the animal soul. It was like in exile. In the exile, where in the sitra acha, which causes the body to sin and drags it down with itself to the lowest depth. So low, in fact, that is even lower than the impurity of the sitra acha and the clippers of idolatry, may God preserve us. There is no greater exile than this exile of the divine soul with the animal soul that is brought on through sin. It is a plunge from the lofty roof to a deep pit. pit. Because as I explained earlier, the source and root of the Jewish souls is in the divine wisdom. And God and his wisdom are one and the same. 
So therefore, when a person commits a sin, he drags down this godly divine wisdom all the way down to the bottom. So the Alter Rebbe, Alter Rebbe concludes here with the imagery. And he says, picture this image in your mind and that will stop you from sinning. He said, picture you're taking the king's head and you're putting it down into a toilet full of dirt, full of filth and excrement. And you're going to say, I'm only doing it just for a second. Really? Of course, not, you're not going to do this. It says, Dal Tereb, Evoke Marshal, Oiches Beroyesh Shalmelech, Omerida Lemat of a Tayman Pan of Besek Besakisim Alitsoya. It is comparable to one who seizes the king's head, drags it down, and dips it in, dips in his face in a privy full of filth. The ultimate in humiliation. Even if he does it only for a moment. For the clippers in the sitra acher are called vomit and filth, as is known. This is the end of this chapter. Chapter 24. But al Rebbe is telling us, basically, keep this truth in mind. Realize who you are. Realize you're in a Shama Kvesha. You are representing God. You're representing the Holy of Holies. And if you go down and you commit a sin, even temporarily, it's like taking the king's head and dipping it into the filth only for a second. Of course, you're not going to do it. You don't want to be separated from Hashem. You don't want to drag down your godly soul into this lowest of the lowest. So keeping this imagery, maybe we should have a magnet on the refrigerator or something, a picture in, us, in in mind to keep us remembering this truth and that will keep us from sinning. And ultimately will help us to elevate all of the negativity into holiness and to bring the coming of Mashiach very soon. Thank you for sticking with us. It's a long chapter. We shall return tomorrow, Bezat Hashem. Any questions?